Hey, um, I noticed this was on the front end track, uh, which I think is kind of funny. Um, this definitely is not specifically um, anything to do with front end, um, but it is something that I'm, I'm really passionate about, um, which is sort of just talking about leadership and what that means uh, in the career of technology. And I find it's one of those kind of conversations that happens way too rarely at companies to discuss what's the difference between uh, leadership and technical leadership and what is it, you know, why do we have leadership? Um, and I guess a lot of people have questions of, you know, should I be a leader? Is that the way I need to move forward in my career? Um, and I just think that there's very rarely good answers to that. Um, I'm gonna give my take on this today um, and also give some sort of insights on what I think good leadership looks like. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll do Q and A uh, at the end. Um, cool, so who am I? Uh, I'm Hampton, hi. Uh, I've been in leadership positions for over 15 years, uh, which makes me feel old. Um, but yeah, I've had teams up to 100 people. Um, actually, that was as of June, it was 100 people, but uh, currently I am actually CEO of an early stage company called Vue. Um, and I've held positions from, well, junior developer, uh, up, you know, CEO and CTO and VP. Um, and yeah, I was most recently at, at Rent the Runway, uh, for anybody familiar with that. Um, but I'm usually put in the front end track because <laughs> I uh, also just, you know, along with my other career of, of having a real job, um, have invented a lot of different sort of open source technologies um, from a ton of Ruby gems, but mostly uh, known for uh, SAS, uh, the CSS language and Haml, which was kind of a rebellious markup language that sort of inspired a whole lot of white space sensitive um, HTML markups. Um, and yeah, I, I built one of the first mobile websites in the world for sort of iPhone and uh, interactive things at Wikipedia. So if you've looked up Wikipedia on your phone, uh, use something that I, I uh, started. Um, but like I said, my actual career is, uh, I, I've never actually done open source for a living um, at all. and. Uh, I just get to throw the logo here of the company I'm founding. We're, we're super early stage. Um, check us out, view live. There's nothing totally public yet because we're half, this is in that awkward moment where there isn't like, we're, we're kind of pre-launch, but um, been doing it since June. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of mentioned this before, but you know, this talk should only take about 20 minutes. We'll see uh, how things go. Um, and usually this topic has an awful lot of questions people have just about business or leadership or how you think about a tech company or what you, you know, challenges you faced. Um, and, uh, I'm just going to preempt too. during that section, since this is recorded, I am not going to say your name out loud. If you have a question to ask, um, I will just answer the question that won't be in the recording. So you can ask something that you maybe wouldn't want me to say your full name as I read the question out. Um, Cool, Let's, we're gonna go over four main things uh, in, the, in the heart of this talk. One, the goal of leadership. Um, why, why are we doing this? The types of leadership positions and how are they different? Um, what an effective team means and how do you know when you've, you've built one? Uh, and then really just sort of about discovering yourself. Um, and I think that's actually the area that most people uh, are, are interested in, to be honest. Um, and I love this quote, uh, treat people as if they uh, were what they ought to be and you help them become the thing they're capable of being that in a word to me is what or that that represents what good leadership is to me um, if that sort of thought resonates with you and makes you feel a lot of value you might be good for people leadership um, but you also might be good for leadership in other ways um, which we'll kind of get into a little bit but Let's go to what's the goal? Why, what, why do we have leaders? Um, why is then the org flat? Um, and look, a lot of jobs, you know, it feels like maybe your boss or people you work for, uh, like is, is the job of a leader to ship products? Is it to go to meetings? Is it have one-on-ones? Is that what I'm doing? Am I writing job requirements? Like, should I be demanding? Should I like keep people in their place? Should I be super nice? Should I be everybody's best friend, right? Um, I guess, am I hiring people? Is that my only job? Like getting them not to quit? Like what, what, what is the goal of what I am doing here? Why am I doing any of this? Like none of those things 
Uh, those can be techniques. They can be approaches. You know, there's times where being nice is useful. Sometimes you need to be demanding. There's certain moments where that's the correct thing to do. But these are all techniques or attributes, right? They're not um, the goal. Like there are ways to achieve the goal possibly. Um, though you should try to be nice. Um, but the goal of a leader is to empower your teammates to use their talents effectively for their business. Um, I add in for the business. If you're not doing this in a business context, that's, you can also lead. Um, but for the shared goal of why all of us are together, if it's leadership on a soccer team, then it's for the game. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it is about enabling other people, you know, any of those techniques to hire somebody to give them goals to write a job requirement, the whole point of every single thing needs to be empower everybody communally to achieve. Um, and, you know, there could be a lot of complexity to that and a lot of different approaches that kind of depend on the company, the culture, what you're building, how you're building different personality types. But I think no matter what, like it should always be focused on somebody else. I need to make them or help them and like, I think empower the right, give them the tools to be effective for what we're all trying to achieve here. Um, and this is like, this I can't believe is a controversial statement, uh, but it usually is. Um, I shock people with it. Um, almost across the board, we're gonna put a little asterisk for less than 1%, but. Um, people want to do a good job. Like nobody in their career starts wanting to not be good or to be lazy or not useful or not helpful. Are there people who are not useful and are lazy in their job? Sure. Um, but like people generally don't start that way. People tend to start wanting to do well. And a lot of times situations, and usually it's, it's disempowerment, causes people to be, I have the list here, angry, disempowered, sad, broken, passive aggressive, lazy and unmotivated. Um, that's usually because people feel disempowered. Um, they've either been shamed by somebody or not enabled to do a jo good job or they couldn't feel proud about what they were doing. And those, that, is, that is when as a leader, you are doing a poor job. Um, and those are always things to look for, but you know, I think it really is important to focus on like, People want to wake up and feel good about what they've done for the day. Like you want to end the day and go home and see your kids or your spouse or call your friends and be like, I was super useful today. I got so much done, right? That feels so good to people. Um, and for a lot of reasons, people have to stay in jobs sometimes when they're unhappy. Um, but I think as a leader, this is actually people for some reason uh, don't agree with it often, um, but I think it's an important lens. Um, and so, sorry, and it is your job to make sure that people remain there. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about some of the types of leadership positions. And this is like about where on the, the stack <laughs> you sort of sit, because I think people think leadership is sort of like one thing, like you're a manager, you're the boss, um, but it's actually kind of complicated, but I'll simplify it to right, what I have here is sort of a rough estimation. So individual contributor is somebody, the phrase for, somebody who is doing the primary work of the team or the business. So a coder um, is an individual contributor. Um, a manager uh, in my mind is a person whose primary job is to, it's empower, but to ensure that those people um, uh, are getting their job done. And then the leader of leaders, I think, I guess I did this, backwards you now as I'm looking at my slides. Let's start at the top. Um, so like a CTO, a VP, or a director, depending on the size of your company, your job is to make sure that other leaders are able to make sure other people do their job. Um, so you're focused on things like policy, strategy, like overall big investments for a business. And once again, putting my own thing, it's all about empowering the people who are actually doing the work. But you know, you have a step of separation from that work actually happening. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I uh, in my last role around the runways, VP of engineering, like I spent a significant impact amount of time I did where like, you know, deployment rules, um, what, you know, how our vacation policy functioned. Uh, one was like the employee handbook and how like the uh, writing a acceptable use policy that I felt was ethically aligned with the company. 
um, and what we were trying to do and like as a message and like to do that type of job, you really have to think that matters, um, even though it's just paperwork that people get and only sometimes do they read it. Um, but a manager, yeah, your job is to focus on the team, keep them productive and happy. And it's much closer to whatever a delivery goal is that's sort of more tangible. Um, and then a, yeah, so a senior individual contributor um, does also have a type of leadership. Um, so like a staff engineer, um, and, you know, you can empower at an IC level, you know, you can teach people things or do code reviews or mentor, or do presentations. Um, but, you know, and more junior, you spend more of the time um, working on deliverables. Now, what are the impact? Why am I focused on this? Like, what are the impacts? Um, because this is something that confuses <laughs> a lot of people. Um, the more senior in an organization you are, your job has a larger scope. So your impact is, is larger. And the further down into an individual contributor or junior individual contributor, so your, what your, your level of scope is much smaller. Um, leader of leaders, it's, it's abstract. A lot of what you're dealing with, there are no clear concrete answers and a lot of ambiguity is what you need to deal with. You make a change to a, a policy or something, you might have, 10% of the, your team hate you and quit, right? And that might be what you have to do, but like, you're, it's complicated. Um, also leader, leader, more unknowns uh, is much more of a blank canvas. Um, there's things you might not ever learn if uh, you did it. And then as you're more junior, you know what your job is. You have tickets, you've got a sprint, you know what you're doing, you've like talked through stuff. Um, leader of leaders, people don't talk about this. There's less direct satisfaction um, at the end of a week, uh, as a leader of leaders, uh, it is near impossible to know if you did a good job or to walk away and be like, nailed it. Look at what we did. It's very large. There's a lot of teams, a lot of things happening, a lot of departments. It's very like, you know, you might not, you might like have most of your teams doing well and you just know somebody gave notice and like, it's really hard to like be like, yay, so everybody's doing great, but my friends is leaving, right? Or something like, it, it, it's a little harder to like point at something. Um, and then, you know, I think this, this is kind of, I've been alluding to it, but like, it's, it's hard to know what success is at very senior levels because like the CEO of Instagram, Instagram super popular, was bought by Facebook, very, made a lot of money. But maybe it could have been bigger. Maybe, maybe it should have been buying Facebook. Did you make the right decision, even at a billion dollars? Like, was that good? And there's no right answer for that. No, nobody knows. You never know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that was the exact right move. Um, and like, you don't really get to look back and say. Um, and then and, and that's a mental thing too. It, it is true. And you might think I'm the most insane person for thinking that a CEO would think I sold a company for a billion dollars and have regrets on that. Um, it is very complicated uh, to know that. But then more junior, you know, sort of like, I did all my points this sprint and held a, you know, a training. I did it. Like my manager's happy. We launched. Um, and like, I think the reason why I'm talking about this is because looking inside yourself about what type of roles and like, what are the things you enjoy? Um, like if, you are a person and a lot of analytical people, especially engineers, like to produce something gives you the thrill. It's why you like got into engineering, right? Like I like delivering code. I can do that as a job. I'm writing my code these days. Um, but I've also learned like, I'm fine with totally the ambiguous stuff. I can find that joyful, right? I can find it in there. Um, and I think like that is, you know, and it's going to be a theme of this whole thing. That is your, the number one difference between leadership and not is, are you okay on that clarity of success? Um, sometimes over achievers. So like, let's say you were a track runner in high school and you got the gold medal first place every time. Sometimes it's really hard. Those people struggle in leadership sometimes because you think, well, I didn't get an award. <laughs> what, what, who's, who, nobody told me I did a great job. Because um, that's, leaders don't get told that like you well have you take it in q a uh but like you don't um I, I think other people think that happens uh 
it's not all bad, by the way. Leadership's really, really enjoyable, but it's just some of those aspects just aren't there. Um, and so let's talk about a little bit, like, how do you know, like, when you do have to look at, am I doing a good job? Like, what does it mean to empower my teams? And how do I know if I'm doing that? Um, there we go. So Google did, they spent a ton of money. This was, I think, like uh, late 2000s. Um, they spent a ton of money trying to figure out how to build effective teams. Obviously they invest a lot in their workers and they wanted to try to put a little more science to what they've been doing. And uh, the number one thing, uh, and it's here on purpose, is something called psychological safety. And that is, can you take a risks? Can you, sorry, can you take risks without feeling insecure or embarrassed? So if you fail something, you take on a ticket and you fail and it doesn't look good. Um, or the, the team trusts each other and that you can make a mistake and that is okay. That was the number one indicator when they looked at teams. So more than, and I wanna point out other things, things that are on here, this is about total effectiveness of the team. Things that are on here are not, do they have a master's degree? Years of experience had way less to do with team success um, than these attributes. And even teams that didn't quote unquote get along when they had these um, performed. Like it was, it, it's very interesting. They've got this all on their website. You should go check out more. Um, but another one, dependability. Um, can you count on each other? Structure and clarity. Do I know if I'm doing a good job? What am I supposed to be doing here? Um, like, how do I know I'm doing a good job? Um, is there is there meaning to your work? And by the way, I, that is important um, to make sure that people know how they're having an impact. Um, but I just want to go back. These are in order. It is much more important that you feel safe than you work on meaningful work. Um, it is much, much more important. Um, and then, yeah, the last one is sort of, are you making a difference? Um, which I think people think the impact or the meaning are you know, the number one thing that would keep people motivated. Um, but having the safety to try um, and fail is, is a thing that has sort of the outsized um, impacts. And this goes to a word that um, is uh, really, there's a great book called Culture Code um, that talks about this a lot. But a lot of these attributes, dependability especially, and psychological safety, is leaders, we, I, personal opinion and others, but uh, we need to be vulnerable. And that means I have to model for my teams that I trust them. Trust is often described as something that grows over time just naturally, like um, that I have a neighbor and the fact they haven't robbed me yet, though we've never talked, um, that I now trust them. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't actually work that way. If I give them a key, they actually, that made me vulnerable. Now they have a key to my place. Um, I'm more likely to grow trust with them. They're growing trust with me too, because they know that I trust them. And so therefore there's a lovely synergy. Um, and that is like vulnerability is those steps you take to open yourself up. And, you know, I tend to, in an interview or where I'm talking to people, you know, I share my struggles. Like I, I've been interviewing uh, some junior developer positions and, you know, I know times have been very tough out there for uh, junior developers. I'm sure some people on this call are, you know, trying their best to get their first job. And like, you know, it took me four years due to some, I dropped out of college and it was the dot-com bus, but it took me four years to get my first job. And like, I think I'm a pretty darn good programmer. I think I've been pretty, good in leadership, but one of the reasons why it's 15 years and not like 18 um, is because I couldn't get a job. Like I couldn't get my first chance. And once I did, my career took off. Um, but, you know, I can admit that I wasn't able to get a job like that makes people now they they see me being vulnerable and now they'll share with me their actual experience. Right. And that is the way I want to start out every working relationship. And when you do that, that gives people psychological safety because I'm saying, hey, I've been through this, too. We can do this together. Right. I make mistakes. That's really important. When you're saying that as a manager, um, like you are modeling the behaviors that you need in your teams. Um, and there's the most important words in any level of leadership. If you are a staff engineer or a manager, you need to use this word at least once a day. I don't know. It is so important to say when you don't know something because um, you don't. There are things you do not know. And leadership does not mean you have all the answers. It means you might try to solve them, you'll try to unblock things, but you don't know. 
you don't know things. And specifically, you know, like not having all the information or going to get it later or letting people know that they don't have to know everything. Um, it can be a really toxic environment, which I think most companies um, or many companies and many managers and senior tech leadership just won't say this word. I mean, I've certainly worked with people who I've never heard them say they don't know. They go, of, co of course, of course, of course, yes. Hmm. Yes, I'm familiar with the Six, six Sigma 9B. Yeah, I'm, what, what do you think I am, an idiot? Um, and that just like doesn't build trust or this vulnerability. So here's it like, I'm gonna do a little role play. Um, let's say that a very difficult technical situation came up and you know there's a race condition in the database. Um, and so one of your employees or coworkers comes to you and is like, oh, that was horrible. Um, and kind of, I would say the traditional non-vulnerable models, like, yeah, uh -huh, no, it's actually, look, it's a race condition. You should go figure it out. Like, this is easy. Like, I can't believe it took you this long to notice it. Um, or you say, um, like, I don't, I don't know how this difficult issue works. Can you explain it to me or let's help figure it out together? Like, I'd love to hear what you've discovered so far. Um, like, let's, let's try. Um, I, I hate these really tricky cases, right? They, they, they're very difficult. And like, when you say that, like, the engineer is much more motivated, I believe, in the second one. Because um, you're like, all right, cool. No, it's great. I was stressing out about it a lot. But now, like, I'm going to go figure it out. Like, I can do this. It is complicated. Like, you're validating that they're trying. Um, and, uh, like, here's another one. So this, this is classic. Somebody comes on who is very green, new to the job, and they are asking to take on a very large project. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders, it's very important. And, you know, it is a leader that can be a scary ask because you've got to hit a balance here on how you respond. Um, and I've definitely seen this traditional answer from a ton of people. Uh, that's only for senior people to work on, it's too important. Uh, you might mess it up and we can't risk that. Um, the right way to do this is when I was just starting out, I really struggled with a big project. Like, can you tell me more about how you want to solve it? And then I'm giving them, first of all, I started with that there was something that I needed to like, just to let them know um, that I'm human. Um, and then I'm asking, I'm giving them a bit of a stage because maybe they actually can handle it, right? I actually, as a leader, this might be a brilliant engineer who's perfect for this, or they actually have no idea. And they were just like, somebody encouraged them or, or they've got notions. Um, that's an Irish phrase for any Irish people on the call. Um, but, you know, I also want to say like, it's funny doing these examples um, where I'm starting out in, with almost all of these admitting something that um, like I can't do or, or some like, you know, nagging myself almost, or it can sound like that. You have to remember that from the view of an employee, their manager or manager's manager or somebody in a leadership position, um, they will default to thinking that they, sorry, they first of all don't get to talk to you that often, like probably you're not spending all day talking. Um, they're nervous when you're talking about one of these sensitive subjects um, and they think that you're gonna give the traditional response or they're worried beforehand. So even though it seems a little crazy to always sort of say stuff, actually the perception um, is different than it sounds like as a, as a leader. Um, I think the, I love the uh, Steve Jobs, uh, was it tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them that you told them. Um, and that in any time you're giving information, tell it at least three times. Um, and that's the only way people really remember things. And it sounds a little bit crazy. If you go back and watch a Steve Jobs uh, presentation, he'll say the same damn stuff over and over again, but those are some good presentations. Um, and uh, okay, let's talk about feedback though. So, so far it sounds like working for me would be, <laughs> as an example, I would be nothing but nagging myself and uh, you know, nice all the time. Being vulnerable and that equity that is built up by doing that allows a leader to give feedback. And feedback is when you tell somebody that it is not going well, that there is something that they need to change. Um, feedback 
it took me at least 12 years of being in leadership before I think I was half okay at it. And it's still something that, that requires practice. But, you know, the core thing that I focus on is that it's much worse not to give feedback. Let's say you have somebody on the team and they never write tests. And you've kind of mentioned to them a couple of times, um, but maybe just like only in passing or like a passive aggressive PR uh, response. They, there might be a couple of different reasons why that's happening. Um, but if you pull them aside separately and say, I just have to let you know, I like your job, you need to write tests. That is a requirement here. You have not been writing them. Those are not meeting expectations. But I know you can do it. And if you need help, reach out at any time. Let's talk about this next week. But I really need you to make sure that you're focusing on building those tests. And let me know anything I can do to help you write tests better. You have to say things like that. And when you've built up that vulnerability with somebody, they know you have their best interest at heart. I'm not coming from a place of I'm the greatest. Um, I don't try to do a quote unquote shit sandwich. I don't know. Can I say that on this? Um, you just say to the issue and what the follow up is. Um, and you just say it as directly and concisely as possible. Um, I sometimes, when I was first learning to do this, I'd write it down and make sure I'd like almost workshop it to make sure I had the right words and practice it and say it as straightforward with no emotion and just a very direct sort of statement. And, you know, I, I'm an emotive person and like it is at first unnatural, but I can tell you it works. Like I have had employees who they were unhappy in their job. They didn't know, a lot of times they don't know what an expectation is. People just wanna know what it is to do a good job. Um, and that's where like this very simple phrase, it's not that simple. Um, trust drives usefulness, which drives respect, which I think drives happiness. Like this is how you build a team. This is how you have a high performing team who are engaged in what they do by building that sort of feedback. Like one thing I tell people who work for me is I am striving that you will never, like you'll never not know what I think about you. <laughs> like I am not going to go beneath my breath, talk to somebody to the side. Like if you're in my organization, I will tell you how you are doing. Um, I will tell you when you're doing well and I'll tell you when you're not doing well. Like that is something I sign up for as a leader. And they can trust me that like, I am telling you and I will tell you. Um, and that like gives, that actually gives people safety. That's the other thing, right? So a lot of times if you're a manager who just relies on like oh, little subtle hints and intuition, you know, and you're hoping they pick it up, people get paranoid. <laughs> like I, and I have messed up in the past with this, like a ton, you know, I thought I was sort of subtly indicating to somebody some information about what I thought or that they weren't doing what I expected. And I didn't address it. And, you know, I ended up letting that person go. And, you know, I had team members who were just like, are you going to do that to me? Like, you know, I, they saw why I did what I did, but it was like, they, it, it hit safety, it hit safety a lot. And that was, you know, that was something that I, I really regret because I think if I with them had been giving better feedback continuously, I don't think we would have been in that situation because they'd be like, yeah, I know. He tells me when I'm doing well and he tells me when I'm not. Um, and like those two things are very important to know the difference between. Um, cool. Last one's just self-discovery. And like, once again, all these things are underpinning the same. Um, can you value indirect outcomes? That is the core question to me of if you can do people leadership or if it's a good fit. No, do it. Sorry. Enjoy it. That is far, far, far more important. Uh, if you enjoy it, you'll eventually get good at it. Um, if you hate it, you will not. Uh, but can you value indirect outputs? So can you look at, you know, like I, like, in my current startup, like, can I, no, I didn't build most of it. I'm not involved in it. I didn't do our marketing campaign but I enabled those, th those things that happen indirectly. And like, can you as a uh, analytical minded person, which I'm guessing almost everybody on this call it an open source conference is, uh, I, which I am, uh, but as an analytical minded person, can I convince myself to look at those things and drive satisfaction from them? Um, because this is like the number one thing that I see burnout from leaders. Like, there's a lot of times where people move into leadership positions and then are miserable and usually they end up quitting, um, which like, you know, the 
Um, the normal kind of path here, if this is a direct path, and, and this is where my philosophy on this is that, you know, sort of after you're a senior IC, you kind of either move into like pure technical leadership or people management, which is sort of at the top. Um, and we do, I think it's a good way to, to look at it, especially I think it's good to call out that there are career options outside of people leadership that are paid very well and you get lots of important things. They do have some of the similar abstracts. A principal engineer isn't launching the same way. They are, it's very technically minded. They're not dealing about people's feelings quite as much, uh, but mentoring, making big decisions, those are still, still there. Um, I think at any level of career growth in any industry, there's some level where you say, how far can I push myself into those abstract uh, takeaways? But so many times people and pro possibly people in this call, your manager or director or VP or one of these, you know, they went down that path because they thought that was the only path. And once your pride is there, but you hate your job and you're supposed to be responsible for people, uh, it is not a, you know, a happy ending. Generally people quit, you know, I, I've had this happen to me. I promote somebody to manager. Three months later, they quit and they took an IC job at another company. And I'm like, oh, wait, no, I, I just, because I trusted you, you should come back. You asked for it. You know, a lot of times they, they begged and scream, I want to be a manager. Um, and that's why I just think it's really important to put these arrows back. <laughs> you can move back into the pure technical roles. That is like, if, if it, your company, that isn't true, um, you should go. Uh, same thing happened to me, welcome. Um, so you can always move back. And I think it's really important to let people know um, that they can. And yeah, once again, if your company doesn't have this, I recommend suggesting it um, just to explicitly sort of say, um, you know, you could move all the way up to VP, but if you haven't actually extended your technical skills, you don't get to move just down to principal, um, which also having this structure, you know, the fact that there's authority attached with the people management in many different ways, um, like a VP can overwrite a principal on certain things because theoretically they're looking at some more of the business strategy maybe than the principal is. Um, but with that, like there's also has to be rec uh, like recognition that people like the technical path is hard earned, you know, and that is something that you do have to work out from just because you had a bunch of direct reports and wrote a good policy does not mean that you are necessarily, you know, a good engineer. Um, and sometimes that's why the diverging path can be sort of a thing. Um, so I've always just said you default back to senior IC and we'll work you back up if you want. Um, and I've had people take that option and they've been very happy after they've done it. Um, and I just think like, I call it to find your core value. Like in any situation, just find where you can be value, how you can deliver value to what everybody's trying to do. And like that might be in people leadership uh, that might be by taking a ticket, right? Or working on a bug. Like I don't, that that can be a thing, but find find the biggest positive impact you can and put yourself there. And if that's leadership, push into it like heck. If the things I've been saying, you're like, that's me. I'm great with that. Do it. Um, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know, abstract. I don't like that. I like concrete classes. Um, then, you know, prob probably, focus on that technical thing. There's a great career there. Um, but either way, make sure you're having fun. Like it is work, but if you are miserable, you are doing the wrong thing. <laughs> like you're in the wrong position. Um, we are lucky in this industry that there are choices, uh, less choices if you're a junior developer during COVID. Um, but, you know, even if you are stuck at home, there's lots of volunteer opportunities. I know our moderators, some of them, uh, have, have been doing this and like go do those ways to add value and like find the fun in it um, and, and go after that. Um, so this wraps up the content part. How do I do? We got 15 minutes left. Um, so let me stop sharing so I can see. Um, there you go now. I'm just bigger for all of you. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, any really, this is pretty wide ranging. I'm, I'm happy to talk on pretty much anything. Um, and I'll repeat once again, I am not going to say the name of whoever said anything just because this is recorded and I want to give you all the psychological safety. Um, cool. Um, so there's a little Q and A feature. 
No questions. Um, oh, was, uh, somebody said, uh, I did just that. Oh, you just moved from a technical lead back. Yeah, that's, and like, don't, I'm so glad to hear that your company supported that. So many people let that be a bad thing. Like that is not, I think to be a leader, you have to be a little bit crazy, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, are there any correlations that I've seen between age and technology related coding type jobs? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I, I feel like maybe what you're asking is like, is ageism real? Um, it is. <laughs> uh, I think it, it can be a little bit tough. Um, there's a couple different ways to deal with uh, getting older in this industry. Um, I mean, first of all, coming to conferences like this and hearing about other people's experiences helps a lot. Um, I think people get the wrong impression. I think as a person, who, who's up there and, and or like who's later in their career, um, there's fear in a lot of, I've heard, I, like I hear this in like manager conversations, you know, when you're doing like a hiring panel and I, I try to call it out because I actually, best hires I've ever made are people who are more advanced in their career because they've seen some stuff. Um, but there's basically the idea like, have you been stuck in one thing? So you can either basically get stuck in one thing and like do it. So if you, if there's a technology that you love, like stick with it long-term and just be like, the, the joke is that like, there's always like Fortran programmer jobs, like they get paid a whole lot of money and they're like all the, all the code you're writing will be legacy code one day. Um, that's not a very inspiring answer, but that's part of it. Um, but the other one is just to actively continuously learn. Um, like that's, stay up with the latest stuff, teach yourself new things every year. Like technology in the fact that it is novel requires sort of a level of like novelness and the majority of what people work on. Like, like new is, is what we're building. Like technology is about changing the status quo. Um, farming, like using a, a plow was technology for just a little bit of time and it remained technology, but now it's invisible and you don't even think about it, right? That's not a tech job to, to use a plow. Now to make a more advanced machine that is. So we're always on the cutting edge. So I think sort of either like focus in on the thing or just make sure on your resume when you're job hunting, it's really super clear that you sort of kept up with things um, and it stinks. Um, I wish it wasn't true. Um, what are some of the books that have influenced me on leadership? I come with a core distrust. Um, I think we can get a psychology of it a lot. Distrust of other people's strong opinions. But there's one book that I will give a total strong answer to for recommendation. It's called Culture Code. Um, I, I basically read it and was like, oh, OK, this, this matches my experience and what I've seen very closely. Um, and I basically made sure all my managers went and read it just because it was very aligned with, with my view and a lot of the stuff I've been talking about here. Um, I also like Brene Brown stuff, um, Brave. Uh, she has a lot of stuff on bravery and, and vulnerability and stuff. So it's all pretty, pretty aligned there. So I, I recommend anything by any of them. Um, favorite part about being a manager. I mean, y'all really came with good questions real fast. All right. Um, favorite part about being a manager. Uh, oh taking a bet on somebody and seeing them succeed. Like, I am so proud of the people I've hired who were non-traditional in so many different ways. Like, uh, I'll like, well, to go to the ages of question, I heard a guy who was like in his sixties, who was, was at Kodak for like 20 years and um, like a hard smoking Frenchman. And like everybody else in, when I made the decision was like, what? he has no cloud experience. He like literally did wiring. And I was like, this guy could be our director of cloud. And at that company, he was amazing. He learned it all so fast and it all just hit pair. And like, that is what I, I love giving somebody a chance who is just not in a great situation. And sorry, obviously like junior people, people in underrepresented groups like that. That's the, the worst part is yeah, it's the lack. It, it there's, you always have to watch what you say. That's the worst part about being a manager because your words have power, which is great but they also have negative power, right? It, it, is a, it is a power. And so if you phrase something poorly, like you can really impact people in a lot of different ways from legally to emotionally. And I think that's, it requires, like, it just requires you have to have a filter on. Um, and that's, that can be very draining. Um, 
how do I recommend going about getting, asking for promotion uh, at each level isn't clearly defined. Oof, I hate it when they do that. Um, so <laughs> there's a couple of things. Uh, I, in my last, we, we don't have one yet in this company because I have two employees, but um, we had a very detailed, what we call a continuum. It was basically career ladder on steroids um, and it, it ran the runway and it's, a, it's very effective. Um, and we did assign kind of numbers at different skills like feedback or systems design or languages or whatever. There was different like levels and each one had a very clear or as best of clear definition as we could get at every single level. So there's something like, like a thousand different descriptions um, were in this thing. Um, but uh, I'm gonna, okay, that could be a whole talk itself. I'm gonna give you the actual advice. If you actually want a promotion and you actually want a raise, you need to go get a competing offer. It's, we're not supposed to say that. I feel like the managers, the leadership guild will like turn in my card, um, but you need to come with something else, especially if you're looking for um, money. Like it is amazing how quickly uh, people will change it. Um, now, that being said, obviously, I'm assuming at this point that you've been getting, you've been asking for feedback, you've been working on your skills, you've been doing mentoring, you've been doing the things, you've been asking coworkers or using whatever utilities are there. I'm assuming that happened. Uh, don't go do it. If you stink at your job, then they're just like, all right, get out. Um, all right, five minutes left. Um, uh, how much, how do you know how much risk to give a junior developer in project assignments? Uh, risk is fine. Just keep it short. Keep the time period short for what they're doing. So. I might throw, like if a developer saying, hey, you're not challenging me, I'll be like, all right, cool. Like, I need you to go wire up this very complicated part of it. And like, let's talk, like I, it would take a senior developer two days and I'm gonna give you two days on it. Um, like, and be open that you're checking in with them. Like I, the thing you can't do is like, uh, like let them just work on their own in a, a closet on something that isn't, like that nobody's checking in on or looking at like that, that that's when things go wrong and they get miserable and they're panicked. And sometimes um, actually the person I mentioned earlier, I had to let go is more, he was more junior than I thought. And I was just like, I don't know, I trust you, you've got it. Um, and like that didn't go well. So it's not actually the risk. I think the risk is the time. So if it's two days and it's something really complicated, you're like, Oh, we need to work on this. Um, I think that's fine. But you also like, it's important to, there are some junior developers who are freaking brilliant. And like, if you're only giving them little simple pieces that are only achievable every single time and like at what you think their levels and not pushing them, then you'll never find out how good they are. Um, what are your suggestions for what kind of leadership roles in tech are open to someone with leadership experience in another industry? Uh, all of them. Uh, in my little chart, I generally, the rule of thumb I say is that you need to become a senior. Uh, sorry, and roles, we usually think senior engineer is sort of the level that any people manager should be in like an organization. I think it's very bad if you have senior senior leadership who doesn't really understand parts of the stack or parts of the job. Like I think, um, you know, I would recommend if you are looking to go into leadership inside the tech org, which sounds like you'd probably be good for based off this. Um, get as broad of experience, know about databases, know how rendering engines work in browsers, go learn how mobile development works, like get that broad base of systems design and understanding so that you can kind of have an intuition when people work for you who do something that you're maybe not an expert in, but you at least need to know the vocabulary in certain things. So, um, but I think those things apply really well because the technical aspect outside of knowing and being able to translate doesn't matter that much. Um, all right, you have three minutes, don't worry. Moderator, I'm not going to go too long. Um, I'd like to be a tech lead, but I'm afraid it's like a whirlpool pushing me closer to being a manager. Uh, I don't want to be a manager. Uh, I mean, look, just say that to uh, to your leadership. Um, that is that does not need to be the case in most companies. I am more than fine. I would love I'd, I'd love to have more people who are just like you know what a tech lead. I'll run the sprints. You know. I'll be basically one third the manager of this group or help the day to day operations. And like, to me, that's what a tech lead is a little bit separate than like a, like a, a group leader on the tech and like a staff engineer is a little different because you're just bringing your technical skill. But to me, a tech lead is helping with, you're helping run the ship, but you're not like 
one-on-ones all the time. And so just communicate that. That is very valuable in a company. Um, it's a great way actually to learn staff like skills for mentoring and things, because that's a lot of what you have to do. Um, but I wouldn't, don't, don't worry about that. Just go into that role and put, be like, I am happy here. I am not looking to move into manager. I want to continue to improve my tech skills. I don't think I'd be happy. Um, I, I don't think they would push past that. Or I've seen a lot of people I, I've had far more people who are like, can I be manager now? And I'm like, uh, yeah, we got a lot more work to do. Um, all right, one minute, so this will be my last question. Uh, have you ever dealt with an employee that seems slightly sensitive to su suggestions? Communication, sorry, the vulnerability. I mean, I, yes, of course I've had people in that situation, uh, but I, I have to set that up, right? Like I need to let, them see that I'm modeling that stuff. And it's very slow. And sometimes people will take things sensitively. Um, but I find just, you have to be blunt and direct about it. Like it really, and it's not cruel, right? That's very different. Like you just need to say the facts of what you're seeing. From my perspective, this is going on. And I'm allowed to have that perspective because that's basically, that is my job. That's the subtext. Um, and I want to help you. So let's work on that. Um, and I think, adding those things are better. And like, honestly, if they can't take that feedback, then it might not be a great fit, but time, give them time. Um, cool. That is all of my time. Uh, at me on Twitter, if you have any more questions, uh, I'm typing my email address into the chat. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or whatever if people have thoughts or things that they actually want to talk about. Um, but I really appreciate everybody giving me their time. Uh, this has been a real great honor and I love uh, talking about this. So uh, don't forget to tip your uh, the, the waste staff. <laughs>